Council acknowledges the Kulin Nation for their custodianship and management of these lands and waterways, their enduring connection and their elders that pass these practices and wisdom across generations. We are here today with Council to celebrate World Environment Day and the biodiversity of the area. We're here with Deputy Mayor Sandra Wilson and David De Silva and Ranger Andrew Webster. We're going to have a chat with each of them to discuss their favourite areas and topics. Andrew, tell us about some of the natural assets and areas that we have in Hobson's Bay. What we don't often realise over here in Hobson's Bay is that we've got twice as much open space as other councils in the Melbourne metropolitan region. You know, and not only that, but most of them are fairly accessible too. We've got the Bay West bike trail that goes along the path, we've got tracks that go up through all the creeks, and then we've got a park like Newport Lakes where there's a great car park and plenty of access points around there. Cool, Doug. What else have we got? Has there been much change in recent years? Well, what we've actually noticed is that um, we've had a bit of erosion or moving of sand along our foreshores. And we've got down here, just down here at Sea the Altona Coastal Park. There's been a lot of erosion over the last few years. But at the same time, we've actually found there's a big sandbar turning up a couple hundred metres offshore. Now, that sandbar, which is naturally occurring, is actually providing a very large, shallow tidal area which is awesome for our wading birds, particularly our birds that come from the other side of the world, Siberia, Alaska, places like that. In fact, this year we had 19 different species that actually flew all the way over from Alaska or Siberia this year. And then, of course, you've got down the end of the Esplanade here, you've got down at the mouth of Laverton Creek opposite Doug Grant Reserve there, you've got that other land spit that's forming down there as well now, which again is providing awesome habitat for the, the bird life and wildlife in the area. And I suppose another thing I'll, I'll mention on this is what's been going on in council is that now we've got this great sort of system of wetlands as well now. And these wetlands are actually trapping the stormwater, the rainwater. So in the old days when maybe water rushed down the gutters, down the roads, picked up litter, oil, rubbish on the way, took it out to the bay. Now we've got wetlands like at Cyril Curtin at Williamstown, the Rifle Range, wetlands, Truganina Park wetlands down here, and even wetlands up at Laverton. And they're just, um, aside from filtering out the baddies out of the water, they're really awesome habitat for whether it's ducks, frogs, any of those sorts sure. of animals, awesome actual habitat. And I suppose one for the sport finds, sport guys out there is that um, we also use any excess water to irrigate some of our ovals now as well, which saves us using the drinking water. So that's a really good change. Great. Can you tell us some more about these open spaces? Yeah, sure, Doug. Yeah, well, one of the beauties we've got over here, aside from having so much open space, is we've got such diversity. We've got the parks like where we are here today, Logan Reserve, like manicured parks. We've got awesome sports grounds. We've got the Botanic Gardens down at Williamstown, an awesome place and historically very, very significant. And then, of course, you've got the places where I'm really sort of fond of our conservation reserves, where you've got our old, our old Altona Tip that's now Truganina Park. You've got the old explosive reserve, you've got the old rifle range reserve that's now, well it's still the rifle range reserve yep. but now it's been rehabilitated, you've got right. the old quarry that's now Newport Lakes, yep. you've got the old, old Williamstown race course which is the Altona Coastal Park and then you've got the old sort of dredging or dumping grounds down in Newport that are now actually known as the Sandy Point Nature Reserve and then of course don't forget the creeks, Corrie Creek, Laverton Creek, Skeleton Creek, these areas that used to be just um, probably used by undesirable people, dumping zones, things like that. Now, predominantly with the help of awesome help from environmental volunteers, friends, groups and the like, and obviously with council, those areas now, they've got walking paths through them and they're very desirable places to go now, aside from the fact that they're great habitat for our native animals. What are some of the native animals that our visitors can expect to see? Well, I've already touched on, on the birds. We've got a massive variety of birds and ducks around here. In fact, 
Somewhere like Newport Lakes alone has more than 160 species in itself just there, and that's only one of our reserves. Then you've got all your, your reptiles, your things like your blue tongue lizards, your Cunningham skinks, our friendly tiger snakes, of course, which we all love. And then something that a lot of people don't really sort of, we, I suppose we don't see them, is our nocturnal animals. So we don't think about them much. I suppose we all know we've got possums around, our brush tails and ring tail possums. We've got owls about. Again, you tend to not, not see them, but they're out there. And the other thing that's worth touching on is our bats. Yeah. Most people probably know about the grey-headed fruit bats, but what we don't think about is our little micro bats. And as the name says, they're micro. They're only sort of so big. And they're the type of bat you'd love in your backyard on that warm summer's evening. They're out there eating your moths, all your bugs, and most importantly, they're eating your mozzies. So something really, really important, one of the animals we've got quite a lot of, different species and large numbers, that we don't tend to think about too much. Okay. Andrew, tell us how we can protect these animals. I suppose I can simplify it by saying doing the right thing. But what is the right thing? We've got a lot of, um, I suppose I'll start with our pets. Yep. Um, we'll start with dogs. We've got a lot of signs around the place that say dogs must be on lead or please do not take your dogs into an area or dogs prohibited. Well, they're for a reason. Now, the number of times I get people say to me, especially along our foreshore area, oh, but my dog doesn't chase the birds. Well, it may not necessarily chase them, but it's disturbing them. They may be sitting on a nest, they may be feeding, they may be resting. The dog's still making them fly up, go somewhere else when perhaps they don't really want to. And then there's the other situation where we might say, no, dogs aren't allowed in there. And then people put them on the lead and think, well, that's okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that way they can't chase anything. But what they forget is that dogs also leave a scent behind, especially so if they go to the toilet. Now, so if they walk past, the, let's say, a swan's nest, and the dog maybe cocks its leg or something yeah. like that, then that might be enough to stop the mother duck or the father duck coming back onto that nest sure. again. So that's why we say things like that. And then, and then we've got our cats. Now, the statistics show, and there's been some recent surveys on it, show that for every roaming cat, that's it's cats that are allowed to sort of roam our parks and outside in the daytime, and more importantly in the nighttime, they kill on average 186 animals a year. It's a staggering wow. number. So obviously it's really, really important we care about cats inside, and particularly in the evenings. And then the other thing is that, you know, say you find an injured animal in one of our parks or something like that, there's an organisation called Wildlife Victoria. They're staffed by volunteers. And if you do see something that looks like it might be struggling, injured, dehydrated, something like that, you give them a call and they'll point you in the right direction. Either they'll come and actually take the animal off your hands and look after it, or they might just suggest you take it to the local vet or something like that. Andrew, can you tell us how we found out more about these parks? Um, yeah, well, there's a number of different ways, like we've got, there's obviously information on the council website and Dr sure. Google of course has lots of stuff as well, but inside our conservation reserves we've also got a number of interpretation signs, in fact we've got 54 at last count, and these aren't signs that say do not feed the birds, no dogs, no cats, not signs like that, they're actually signs that actually highlight the wildlife that's in the area, what's actually there so that you can actually, when you walk around the park, you can actually look for those particular animals maybe, what you should or shouldn't do to look after them. And so I actually find that generally any of our conservation reserves, if you turn up there, there'll be plenty of interpretation there that help, help you about that. And also, we've also got brochures, and again, like we said before, on the council website as well. Great, so looking out for those signs is a good yeah. way. Dave, why are trees such an important part of the environment and what do you love about them? Yeah, trees we all know are really important. Some people don't understand how important they are. Again, if you jump on Google, um, you'll find a whole range of benefits that trees have to us as people. Um, you'll find 20, 30 different attributes, what, what makes them so valuable. For Hobson's Bay, there's two in particular. The first one being the reduction of heat. Whether you choose to believe climate change or not, it's getting hotter. <laughs> Um, our summers are really hot, a lot of days over 30 degrees, a lot of days over 40. Trees reduce the ground surface temperature. Um, you know, if it's 40 degrees outside, you go under a tree, it's 30 degrees. So they make our environment a lot more comfortable in those instances, um, as well as still encouraging people to walk. If it's a hot day, you're not going to go outside because it's hot. But if you've got a nice trail that's shaded, you're more likely to still go for a walk on a nice hot day. Sure. It'll be a lot more comfortable. The second one is cleaning our air. We have a really big industrial footprint in the municipality, a lot of busy main roads. 
trees are the ultimate air conditioners. They catch carbon, they clean pollutants out of the air, make things a lot more healthy and comfortable for us. So definitely the two biggest values that trees have in Hobson's Bay, reducing um, lo local temperatures, yep. as well as cleaning our air. Absolutely. Are there many other trees in Hobson's Bay area that are important for heritage reasons? Yeah, so uh, touched on, you know, here in Altona and in Williamstown, but in Newport as well, we've also got a, you know, a healthy population of some native trees, big um, um, lemon scented gums in some um, streets there, where there are some trees of, of, you know, great value due to the age and um, also just due to its size and contribution to the landscape. Um, yeah, there's a fair bit there once you dig deep. Sure, people can go and discover their own, can't they? <laughs> yes, exactly, they can. Great. Could you tell us a bit about the important heritage trees in Hopkins Bay and what makes them important? Yeah, so we do have some pockets in the municipality which have some trees which are heavy, uh, significant from a heritage perspective. Here at Logan Reserve we've got the Morton Bay Fig along Queen Street which has just been um, put on the National Trust Register. Right. Um, we've also got the North Oak Island Pines just behind us on the Esplanade. Now these trees are significant for different reasons mainly um, due to age in this instance. Um, the Logan um, Reserve Morton Bay Fig is estimated to be about 100 years old. Right. We've, we've got photos showing the tree still being, you know, um, still sh showing to be a reasonable size in the early 1900s. And we do know that the North Oak Island Pines were planted post-World War II. Right. It's part of a, a project with the Shire of Werribee and the Shire of Altona, as it was called back then. So um, they're significant for their age, but also just for their amenity value. Um, you know, the North Oak Island Pines look fantastic, provide a lot of shade for beachgoers. Typically in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, it was very popular for people to establish cypress hedges to um, protect other vegetation within their, their properties or gardens. It's been done in Williamstown Botanical Gardens and um, here at Logan Reserve, we've got some really old cypresses which were part of plantations from the late 1800s. Uh, early 1900s, again to protect the gardens that they were trying to establish as part of the homestead here. Um, they do, once they do get old, they start to get a few issues, but we try to manage them as best we can to keep them part of the landscape. Cool. We've also got a number of trees in Williamstown, Williamstown being an older suburb, sure. a lot of history there, a lot of old trees yep. in there as well, which are covered um, in a heritage overlay within our right. planning scheme. Um, yeah, some fantastic trees which are uh, have really uh, strong heritage characteristics in Hobson's Bay. That's great. The only thing I love about trees is um, they not only just provide um, just general comfort and make everything feel welcoming around you, but that you can interact with them. Now we're here at Logan Reserve, kids are climbing on the branches and some of the, the lower trees here, people um, are playing hide and seek and pretend they're camping. So you can interact a lot with trees, especially with the younger generation. Sure. You are an advocate for our t great trees in Hopkins Bay. Why is this important to you? Well, Doug, who can deny the majesty of trees in our neighbourhood? We're standing behind, behind and underneath uh, one of the most magnificent trees that we have in Hobson's Bay, which is a Morton Bay fig. It's on the significant tree register and it's one of a multitude of really special trees in Hobson's Bay. But why I care so deeply is trees give us nature on our doorstep and the connection with nature is really important. They are amidst a world of built infrastructure, a magnificent array of green infrastructure which provides habitat, taking away of uh, carbon emissions, um, the protection from the sun, the cooling elements in, in a world that's uh, dealing with climate change. And as I began, the majesty of trees is just something that's so special. And if we need any further evidence or understanding, well, we just all have to read the Lorax and, uh, and, and see why trees are so important uh, in any community in any neighbourhood. That's a great answer. Thank you. Do you have a favourite tree or natural space in Hobson's Bay? That's really difficult because I have many favourite places and many favourite trees across Hobson's Bay. Um, this is, this I'd have to say is one of them, but if I'm going to start in a place where I spend a lot of time, that's very close to the hundred steps up in uh, Altona Meadows, which is close to where I live. 
What we're blessed with in Hobson's Bay is a whole contiguous network and that's a connected open spaces and biodiversity areas, conservation areas that are all joined together. And if you walk through those areas, there's a number of very special trees. I mean, there's lots of trees, but there's some very special trees. Yeah. There's a stand of sugar gums that runs on the edge of HD Graham Reserve, which was the natural boundary of the Truganina Explosives Reserve. And there's something like, I'd estimate, a hundred sugar gum gums that grow in a double yeah. avenue. And until it's actually pointed out to you, you're not really aware of them. But once you see them, you can't unsee them and they're so beautiful. If you continue along the Laverton Creek, there is a, a remnant river red gum that sits just outside the fence of the Explosives Reserve. Right. And that is a very old and significant tree. If you were to bypass it, you just think it's just a stumpy old gum tree, gnarly old gum tree, but it has a lot of specialty about it. There's a bench seat underneath it, and I recommend that anybody go and sit and observe the beauty of this tree. I want to speak a little bit about something that isn't a tree, but is also a favorite. It's in our wetlands, there's old growth forest, which is the salt marsh. Now it's not te technically a tree, mm. but it is a whole array of plants that provide the value to our environment that our trees and urban forest will sure. provide. And so I just like to draw people's attention to the fact that salt, salt marsh, mangroves and seagrass provide just as many benefits to our natural environment and our, and our health and well-being as our big planted trees do. It's still a great, a big part of the ecosystem. Yeah. An important yeah. part of yeah. the ecosystem and those connections between uh, trees, parks, conservation yeah. areas, wetlands, uh, riverways, waterways sure. is uh, critically important and great to celebrate on World Environment Day. That's right, thank you. A lot of people have connections with trees in Hoppers Bay that aren't a part of the National Heritage Tree Register. How do they let Council know and get them engaged and involved? Well, as part of uh, World Environment Day and listening to our very able conservation ranger, Andrew Webster, and also our co coordinator of trees, uh, David De Silva, well, they are very passionate about our local area and they know many of our special and significant trees. If, you wanted to if people wanted to let uh, our staff know about the process to get a significant tree on the National Heritage Tree Register, they would certainly know. But we don't necessarily need the council to do that. I'm undertaking a process on my own to nominate the stand of sugar gums in HD Graham Reserve. And I'm putting in an application myself with the help of a few other people, volunteers, to actually have these trees registered so that they'll be known, protected and celebrated by many more people. So it's easy to find out on Google how to do this process but anyone who loves trees as much as I do and as much as you do Doug yep. could actually find out about that process and do it but our able staff are also very willing to help because we're, we all love trees together. Yeah. Doug right. I understand that you and a number of other residents have had a great deal of input into our World Environment Day celebrations. What else are you aware of? Sure. So as part of the World Environment Day activities Council has supported and created a conservation map where people can see uh, biodiversity and heritage trees on a map of Hoffman's Bay. So they can go and discover their own near them. And uh, that's a great feature that, that will be probably growing, there's a good word. Um, and discover what's in their, in their own area. That's fantastic. And I would just like to thank you for your, all of your input by just a very small reading from the Lorax <laughs> that goes Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you. Thank you too.